I better do a video then. Hey guys, it is Wingy here and welcome back to a brand new video on my channel and a brand new Doctor Who top 10 list. Now I've previously done the new series videos, best and worst of the new series, and I have to say thank you because they are my most popular videos on my channel. But anyway, today we are going to be looking at the classic series of Doctor Who. And putting together this list was pretty hard. This is in no particular order, so number one isn't the number one worst, number 10 isn't the 10th worst or whatever, and as I stress in every video, it's just my opinion and it shouldn't affect yours if you love any of the stories that are on this list. So without further ado, let's get on with my list. with Black Orchid just because it's the shortest story on this list. It's quite a forgettable story, there isn't too much to it. It's only a two-part story, but the thing is, this story really seems like a step backward. If you know 60s Doctor Who, then you will know that the original idea for Doctor Who is that it was supposed to be a kid show teaching them about history and science. So every now and again, they would do pure historical stories, meaning except for the Doctor, the TARDIS crew and the TARDIS, there would be no alien interference or plot or anything like that. But the thing is, from the 1960s, Doctor Who became a much, much different show. So then when you get to the 1980s, you have this pure historical like Black Orchid, but it doesn't really feel right or sit well. Again, like with the stories in the 60s, it is literally just the Doctor, the TARDIS and the TARDIS crew that are the only sci-fi elements in this story. It just seems like a couple of episodes of Midsummer Murder or Poirot or something like that, but with the Doctor in it. Like I say, it's only two parts long, so it's not too bad, but there's just nothing about it that I can recommend and it definitely sticks out like a sore thumb, considering that the story that preceded this was The Visitation, which deals with the Great Fire of London, and it does have an alien threat there. That is the way that Doctor Who in the 80s should be handling historic times. The only reason that you should watch this story, or at least buy it on DVD, is for the commentary with Peter Davison and Janet Field in Sarah Sutton, Matthew Wardhouse, because as usual, those guys are hilarious on commentaries. But other than that, don't even bother with it. If you see it for like a quid in some charity shop, yeah, pick it up for the commentary, other than that, avoid it. Next, we have The Return of the Daleks, the first time that they would appear in colour on the small screen in the 1970s. Day of the Daleks. See, I made it sound more epic there than what it actually is. Just put your minds back to 1972. Say that you're a 10 year old kid and you kind of remember the Daleks, but you've never really seen them properly before because the last time the Daleks were on screen in Doctor Who was back in 1967 with Evil of the Daleks. And then they were taken away from the series until this story their big triumphant comeback into the John Pertwee era. How are they gonna fare? Terribly. The plot of this story is actually very, very good. It's just the execution that really lets it down. Now, I'm not gonna act like in 1972, at the height of the John Pertwee era, that the special effects are gonna be anything spectacular. Because let's be real, they're not. But it's the charm of it and the way that the story is told that really sets the stories of the John Pertwee and a lot of the Tom Baker stuff apart from everything else. Considering that this was the season over, it looks shit. Surely for the season opener and the return of the Daleks, you would have thought they'd have put a bit more money into it. But that isn't really the problem. Like I say, the execution of the story is not done well. It's a premise of these people travelling back in time to prevent a catastrophe on Earth which would lead to the Daleks finding the Earth in a vulnerable state and invading it. That plot is really good. The only problem with this story is, one, the Daleks don't really need to be in this story. And in fact, they do feel like a second thought. And I'm pretty sure on one of the DVD extras, I can't remember for which one, but I think it was Barry Letts or Terence Stix that said something like, we needed a way to bolster the season opener, let's just put the Daleks in it. And it shows that they weren't supposed to be in this story. You have that interesting plot, but they somehow just make it boring. And considering that this is a four part story, it just feels like one of the 60s or season seven John Pertwee stories that are just a massive long slog to get through. And I don't know how they managed to take a plot that is very Terminator-esque before Terminator was a thing. And make it this dreary. It is a huge letdown, especially when you put it in context of this being the Daleks' big return to Doctor Who. And let's get onto those Daleks a bit more, shall we? They've given them new voices, and they don't sound anything like Daleks. Take a listen. What is operating the time machine is an enemy of the Daleks. Like, who 
thought that was good. Surely you would remember what they sounded like, considering Dalek Mania wasn't that long ago. And then you have the big grand finale, where you see the Daleks and the Ogrons taking on this gorilla crew and the Doctor and Unit, and there's three of them. It's not terrible by any means, it's just a massive letdown considering that they had the right elements there, they just couldn't execute it properly. Silver Nemesis is next, which is technically the 25th anniversary special, however if you ask most Doctor Who fans, the real 25th anniversary special is Remembrance of the Daleks because that actually has more to do with Doctor Who and its history than this piece of shit. I love the Cybermen, I think the Cybermen are great and I think typically they have been treated the best throughout the classic series, minus Revenge of the Cybermen, but then you get to this. The problem with this story is it suffers from what a lot of new Doctor Who suffers with, which is too many ideas thrown at the screen at once and none of them really come together. You have this medieval stuff, you have the neo-Nazi stuff, you have the Cybermen, you have the Doctor getting involved. They needed to do one of two things to make this story work. Either take out some of the elements or make it a six-part story so you can fit it all in. There's a lot of strong ideas in this story, but you just feel like they should be separate stories by themselves. To be honest, similar with Day of the Daleks, it does kind of feel like the Cybermen are shoehorned into this story, but obviously they were going to be in the 25th anniversary special because Silver Anniversary, Silver Cybermen. But this story just doesn't work. It's probably one of the low points of the McCoy era, minus season 24, none of which will appear on this list by the way. And the reason why I put Silver Nemesis on here ahead of any other McCoy story is because I actually look forward to it. I've heard about season 24. It's infamous. But Silver Nemesis, I expect it to be something else. And I think that's what's going to be a common thread throughout a lot of this list. It may not necessarily be the flat out just shit ones, but just the biggest disappointments. And Silver Nemesis is probably one of my most disappointed Doctor. I don't know what I'm saying. You know what I mean though? It just disappointed me the most. Not even my favourite Doctor can escape having a place on this list. The Leisure Hive, which is the season opener to season 18. There are a lot of big instrumental changes brought in. John Nathan Turner took over for the first time, and the only time. The incidental music was changed, the title music was changed, the titles themselves were changed, the Doctor's costume was changed, and Tom Baker doesn't give a shit throughout any of the stories. But I can let that pass. What I can't let pass though, is this pile of crap. It's easily the weakest story of season 18. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, worse than Megloss. Megloss is at least fun. The Leisure Hive is boring. The key element to this story is the science of tachyonics. Now, as I'm not a scientist, and I imagine a lot of you people watching aren't either, so you would expect the story to explain what tachyonics is. And it does, but it doesn't do it well enough. So I, I could be wrong, I could just be an idiot. Because of the lack of special effects, or the lack of good special effects, they can't really show you what it is either. So throughout the entire story, which relies on this tachyonics, I just don't understand it. So I'm automatically alienated from this story. But is there anything else about it that's good? Um... Tom's new costume's great, I love that. About it though. Again, production value really hurts this story. The Fomasi look crap. They have some really atmospheric, creepy scenes in the dark where you see bits of them. That's great. When you see them in the overlit 80s set, not so good. And I can't remember what they're called, but the yellow people in this story that have like beehives on their head, yeah, they are some of the worst alien makeup I have ever seen in anything. Not just Doctor Who, just anything. They look so, so shit. Romana gets a lot to do in this story, which is good because I like Romana. And she essentially does carry this story, but she has so much to carry with it as well But yeah, if you're gonna go on a marathon of the Tom Baker era I would advise skipping this and another story that will appear later on my list It wouldn't be a worse Doctor Who list without a Colin Baker story, would it? Having said that, I actually feel really harsh for saying that But, you know, Colin Baker's era does get the worst rep However, I'm gonna go with Time Lash now this is a story that I imagine is infamous, so I'm not really going to go into too much detail about it because if you know Time Lash, you know about Time Lash. Like I've said for some of the other stories, production value really does hurt these stories, but not as much as it does in Time Lash. The Time Lash itself is essentially a Christmas decoration that people fall into and there's this weird fade effect that I could do myself. Actually, I could probably do it better. This story is just so boring. There is nothing to this story at all that is interesting. It's infamous for being the worst worst Doctor Who story, or one of the worst Doctor Who stories, and rightly so. I find that this story does a really bad job
job of world building. You're not really rooting for anyone, you don't really care about anyone other than the Doctor and Perry. Now there are some good guest actors in this story, but they can't really save it. If you don't have the script, it doesn't matter how good you are as an actor, you can't save a bad script, especially when you have the production values that this story did. Now the main creature in this story looks incredible. That is one thing I will say about Time Lash. The creature makeup, I can't remember the name of it now off the top of my head, but it looks fantastic. However, that is literally the only saving grace and all you have to do is just go on Google Images and type in Time Lash and you should find it. That's the only thing you need to see of Time Lash. Sticking with the 1980s now, I'm going to talk about Time Flight. Now this is a really over ambitious story and it came at the end of the season so clearly the budget had run out by the time they got to this. And what we ended up with was a really ugly looking story that just doesn't quite live up to what it could have been. And it's also slightly racist in places. Not like Talons of Wang Chiang racist, but still quite racist. The master is disguised as this big, fat, weird Asian type character. Oh, and he does a load of that stuff. It's really bizarre. Again, the master feels shoehorned into this story. It's one of those stories that you watch it, you kind of get through it, and then at the end of it, you just forget all about it. The master's plan is a typical plan of the master where he tries to take control of an ancient power or civilization you know something like that something that he usually does he does that again in this story and it just doesn't really make sense you have this idea of a plane being taken from modern day to the Jurassic times it's not that exciting of an idea and considering that this followed on from Earthshock it's a huge huge letdown as we are aware Adric dies at the end of Earthshock and they just dismiss his death within the first two three minutes of this story and the doctor says something along the lines of oh well we shouldn't mourn him he just fucking blew up I'm pretty sure he would want you to take a moment of silence or something. Oh wait, you did that with the end credits of Earthshock, didn't you? This story also sees the departure of Tegan, kind of. Which kind of works, but when she comes back immediately in the next story at the beginning of the next season, it just undermines the one thing that normally would attract you to a story like this because a companion leaves. Interesting to note though, this was actually, well, part one, was the highest viewed episode of the John Nathan Turner era of Doctor Who. Ratings did drop considerably during the episode. That kind of tells you everything you need to know. Heading back to the 70s now with another John Pertwee story. The Time Monster, again like Time Flight, is a very over ambitious story. And again, similar to Time Flight, involves the Master with a plan that is sort of typical to what the Master does. As the Master trying to control Kronos from Atlantis. Is it Atlantis? I don't know, but he tries to control this big bird thing that just looks ridiculous with a thing called Tom Tit. Like, who thought of Tom Tit and thought, yes, that's that is perfect. Fucking Tom Tit. Oh, Jesus. This script is better. It's better than Time Flight. But again, it somehow just makes it really, really dreary. There's not many memorable moments in this story. And it is quite a low point for the John Pertwee era. It's kind of a shame that after some of the great stories that Unit had fighting against the Master, this was their last one together. But it's probably still one of the weakest ways that Doctor Who has dealt with the destruction of Atlantis. Not only that, it's a very predictable story. The Master tries to take control of a creature or power or whatever and obviously it's too powerful for him and he can't control it and him and the doctor need to figure out a way to stop it. Very predictable, very boring, very ridiculous. Another one that I would avoid. It's probably the weakest Pertwee story in my eyes. Sticking with the 70s but moving to a different doctor now, Underworld with Tom Baker. Now I've said over ambitious a lot in this list but it really, really, really needs to be the word to describe Underworld. Okay, so it's 1977 and if you're not familiar, this little film came out in 1977 called Star Wars. Wars, which sort of, you know, broke the mold and changed the genre completely. So naturally, Doctor Who want to keep up. They want to still attract the kids who are more interested in playing with Luke Skywalker and Chewbacca toys. The BBC budget would just not allow them to do that in the way I imagine they probably wanted to. Again, a really dull story, and again, similar to the Time Monster, dealing with sort of elements of Greek mythology. Okay, I'm not 100% sure if it's Greek, but it's some sort of mythology anyway. But the majority of this story just seems to be Tom Baker, Louise Jameson, and K9 wandering up and down these generic looking caves which are clearly a blue screen background. Time Flight looked ugly, but Underworld tried to do something that in 1977 isn't really possible. Technology has changed a lot, you know, CGI and green screen, all that sort of stuff. Nowadays, yeah, you can do anything easily. You can do it at the drop of a hat, but it was in a fairly primitive stage back in 1977, and it shows. You can kind of get away with it, but in Underworld, there's a lot, and I mean a lot, of these generic cave backgrounds in front of a blue screen. It just looks so naff. And some of the charm 
Tom, as I say, is Doctor Who's strong point. Thing is, this story doesn't really give you anything else other than something to laugh at for four episodes. The one positive that I have to say about this story is that the design of the Minions, no, not the Minions, not the weird little yellow L people, not them. The Minions, they look really cool, and I like the idea of a species that absolutely despises the Time Lords. Those are the only two good things in this story. It's just a really, really drab story about this crew that you don't really care about. Revisiting the Colin Baker era now with the trial of a Time Lord. Now again, this was a massive disappointment to me. I like Colin Baker. I like his era. I think season 22 is a very underrated season, time lash aside. But this season, this was Colin Baker's last season as the Doctor, and it's one complete story. People argue that it's four separate stories, but it isn't. If you watch the title sequence, it says Trial of the Time Lords, part one, two, three, four, five, etc., until you get to part 14. It is the longest Doctor Who story of all time, and the fact it's so long really hurts it. So you have four distinct separate parts in this story. It's sort of like the past, present, future, that type of thing. But it doesn't really work, and it doesn't really go anywhere. Throughout the entire thing, you're trying to figure out, well, has this been manipulated by the Time Lord? Is this trial a massive sham? Yeah, the Doctor's been put on trial. It's not really apparent why. In fact, it changes every few episodes. They're saying, oh, well, Doctor, you've done this, you've done that. And then partway through, I think it's after Vervo- Yeah, it is after Vervoids. They're just like, oh, the charges has now changed. It's now genocide. And you think you can't just do that in the middle of court. You can't just say, oh, well, it was this, but now it's this. It's really long and drawn out. It's way, way too long. Because at the time, Doctor Who had just been put on a hiatus, they are clearly referencing that. The Doctor is literally on trial, both off screen and on screen. But the stories within that they are trying to tell and they are using as evidence against the Doctor don't really work. The main issue that I have with this story is that not a lot of it is made clear. Which parts of the evidence that we are being shown is true and not manipulated? Dunno. And I hate the court scenes. I really, really do. Again, like the rest of the story, has its moments but overall is a real letdown. Michael Jaston as the Valiard is a really nice addition to Doctor Who lore though. I just wish they had used him properly. It seems like they sort of go to the evidence and then cut back to the trial and then back to the evidence, back to the trial and they do this quite a bit. So it's quite jarring as you're watching it. But the court scenes, they really should be something special. But it's just the Doctor and the Valyard throwing petty and childish insults back at each other. Oh, don't get me started on the cliffhangers as well. Every single cliffhanger, bar a couple, are exactly the same. Usually it's the Valyard saying, well, Doctor, you have done this. And then we just get Colin Baker going, This story could have been so much more, and there are elements to it that I really, really enjoy. So whilst it is definitely one of the worst Doctor Who stories, it's also the rare case where I would actually recommend it, just because one, Colin Baker's on fine form. Throughout this entire season, Colin Baker is great. I won't spoil Who for those who haven't seen it and don't know, but when a certain character dies, Colin Baker's reaction is easily one of the most heartbreaking three words that is ever delivered. If you know what I mean, you know what I mean. And the opening shot to this is the best shot we have had in Doctor Who ever. The model shot at the beginning of part one is worth buying the DVD for. It's incredible, however the only problem is it's clear that the BBC had used all of their budget on that. Once we are done with this impressive giant model work of this spaceship, we immediately cut into a wobbly overlit set where the TARDIS lands and Colin Baker stumbles out. Has its moments, but really, really long and really drawn out. It's a crap story, but if you find the DVD, definitely pick it up because there are moments that you should check out and and the DVD extras for Trial of a Time Lord are fantastic, particularly the documentary Trials and Tribulations, I believe it's called. Very, very good Doctor Who documentary. Story itself, so, we've got to my final choice now, and I think people have been waiting for this story. It's the obvious choice. It's Warriors of the Deep. Is this story bad? Yes. Yes, it is. But for me, it's more of a disappointment because the idea is there. Yet again, though, the execution is not. We see the return of the Silorians and the Sea Devils in one story. The Silorians and the Sea Devils are two of the best John Pertwee stories ever. But this is just a massive letdown. Now, I've spoken about production values. And yes, you can't really hold classic Doctor Who up to today's standards. But having said that, there are some impressive things in that classic Doctor Who did. Just lots of things in Doctor Who do look great. 
Some are a bit naff, but you can live with it. And then there's some that are really shit. And then there's Warriors of the Deep. The Merka alone is why Warriors of the Deep is on this list. When people joke and stereotype saying that Doctor Who was just this cheap looking crappy sci-fi show, they usually show clips from this. And as annoying as it is, I just can't defend this story. I just can't because the script is boring. The actors are clearly bored with it since they had no time to rehearse, I believe. This was the opener of the season and yet somehow the props people were just not ready. The costumes for both the Silurians and the Sea Devils look shit. There's even a moment where two Sea Devils walk into each other. The story is fine, it's just, it's just executed badly. But that is the least of this story's issues. It's everything else surrounding that. Considering that Warriors of the Deep is in the same season as Resurrection of the Daleks, The Caves of Androzani, which are two of the most iconic and best Doctor Who stories in my opinion. I don't know if Resurrection's iconic, but I love it. Considering it's in that same season, I don't understand how this was put ahead of anything else that they had. Although the twin dilemma is also in this season, so you know. But this is far worse. Far, far worse. It's worth a watch. Just for the comedy factor, you know if you just want to roast something, like it's so bad it's good, this is the story to do that with. It doesn't excuse it being fucking terrible though. And that is me done. Those are my top 10 worst Doctor Who stories from the classic era. Like I said at the beginning, they're just my opinion and they're in no particular order. So Warriors of the Deep isn't number one, although it probably should be. If your favourite story's on here, doesn't matter. But what do you think? In the comments below, let me know. Do you agree with my list? What would your list be? And be nice to each other. You know, if you don't agree with either me or anyone you see in the comments, just respect their opinion. I will respect yours. I will be diplomatic. May not seem so, but I will. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like on it and subscribe if you want to see more Doctor Who related content on my channel. I will be next doing the top 10 best classic series stories. Fucking hell, that was a mouthful. And I will also be reviewing Doctor Who series 10. I've been asked already if I'm going to review series 10. And yeah. I am, but I'm gonna wait until it's finished first so I have like the whole thing to sort of sink my teeth into and talk about. So yeah, subscribe if you wanna see that, the top 10 best, and other Doctor Who and other stuff that's on my channel. I have other things. And if you did any of that, then I would love you forever. That's gonna be all from me. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye. Not even my favorite Doctor can escape on the fucking hell. <clears throat>